Welcome to Gospel Preaching, a presentation of Gospel Time Ministries Incorporated. I'm Dave Rigg, coming your way from my home about six miles north of Albion, Illinois. The scripture for today's message comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, and just two verses this morning, verses 38 and 39, from the New King James translation of the original Greek text. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Would you pause just a moment with me for a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I ask for your blessing on the reading of the Holy Word. I pray, Lord, that you would guide me as I preach this message today. Help me, Lord, to speak it clearly and in the way that you would want it to be delivered. And I pray, Lord, that you will send this message out to all the people who need to get it. This I pray in Jesus' name, and amen. The topic of this sermon today is suicide. Now, before I begin, I want to make a couple of things perfectly clear. Number one, in no way, no way at all, do I think that suicide is a good thing for any person to do. I believe it is a very selfish, selfish thing for any person to do because you're not thinking about the sorrow and the heartbreak that your loved ones, your close friends, and other people who care about you, how they're going to feel after you do such a stupid thing as to end your life. It's a selfish thing to do. So don't do it if you care about other people who care about you, okay? This is in no way an endorsement of suicide, and it's in no way an encouragement for anyone to do such a thing. In fact, I hope this message today will serve as the final thing to tell a person who might be thinking about it to change his or her mind and not do it. I would also say, secondly, that I believe that anyone who does go ahead and end his or her life is not rational, and in fact, probably is out of his or her mind, okay? I wanna make that very clear before I continue here. The title of this message today is this, can a Christian who commits suicide still go to heaven? I'll repeat that. Can a Christian who commits suicide still end up in heaven? Now, if you're a Roman Catholic, you are going to say, no way can that person end up in heaven. Even if that person was a born-again Christian, he or she who commits suicide is going to end up in hell because that's the way you're taught in the Roman Catholic religion. Unfortunately, as a Protestant myself, I am sorry to say that there are many Protestants who would also say the answer to that question is no, that if you commit suicide, you're going to end up in hell no matter what. Why would people believe that? Well, again, that's, those answers from a Roman Catholic or even some Protestants are based on assumptions, assumptions, or by teachings of the Pope or the priests or some preachers in Protestant churches. They would say that suicide is a sin, and I would agree with that. And they would also say that it violates God's word that says that we are not to commit murder, and I would agree with that. But here's question number one. Does the Bible mention suicide? 
Well, the answer to that is directly no. You can search your Bible, no matter what translation you might be using, starting from the first verse in Genesis to the very last verse in Revelation, and nowhere will you find the word suicide, S-U-I-C-I-D. It's not in the Bible. And as far as my research is concerned, I have been unable to find any laws in the Bible that specifically talk about suicide, okay? Nevertheless, the Bible does give some examples of people who did, in fact, commit suicide. There are seven examples of suicide in the Bible. Six of them are found in the Old Testament, and just one in the New Testament. The first one I find in Scripture is about a man by the name of Samson. He committed suicide. You can find that story if you want to take some time in the book of Judges, chapter 16, verses 23 through 31. Briefly to tell you, Samson was a uh, prisoner of the Philistines, and he takes, he was a strong man, and he pushes the pillars where he's kept in chains, and the, and the building comes down and kills him. He did something to kill himself, okay? Second example I find in Scripture concerns a man named Abimelech. And he was wounded in battle, so he commanded his armor bearer to hasten his death by killing him. That's Judges chapter 9, verses 50 through 55. Now, I know there he, he tells the armor bearer to kill him, but actually... Abimelech commits suicide himself. Another example is King Saul. King Saul. He was also wounded in battle, and Saul takes his own sword and falls upon it. That's in 1 Samuel chapter 31, verses 1 through 60. Another example of suicide is Saul's armor bearer himself. When his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also falls upon his sword and dies with him. The fifth example of suicide in the scriptures is concerning a man by the name of Ahithophel. His suicide is recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 23. It says that he set his house in order and hanged himself to death. The sixth example that I find in the Old Testament is Zimri, Z-I-M-R-I, he was the king of Israel, and it says that he burned the palace, killing himself rather than being captured by his enemies. That story's in 1 Kings chapter 16. The only example we find in the New Testament is none other than Judas Iscariot himself. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 27 that he hangs himself after he had betrayed Jesus, and because of his guilt over what he had done and his betrayal of Jesus, he goes out and he hangs himself, okay? So does the Bible speak about suicide as far as the word itself, suicide? You'll not find it there, but there are examples in Scripture of people who did kill themselves. Here's question number two. Why do people commit suicide? And that's a good question. Why do people do that? And I suppose, really, there could be many answers to that question. People who commit suicide, I believe, and I've had experience working in the funeral business for a little over 10 years, I've seen many examples of people who chose to end their life. And in many cases, as the story was told to me, people find themselves sometimes in overwhelming situations. And the overwhelming sense or a feeling of helplessness, or hopelessness, or unworthiness drives a person to think that this is the only legitimate thing to do. And many circumstances can lead, in fact, to the act of suicide. Some of the factors are unresolved feelings or events that eventually seem impossible to overcome. Now, friends, let me tell you this. During my life, more than 70 years, okay, 
many more than 70 years. I've had some very, very low times in my life, but suicide was never, ever even a passing thought in my mind, and I'm glad. I'm glad I never let that uh, become a, a thing that I kept thinking about because I always found out no matter how circumstances might seem to come along, they always got better, okay? And it can happen to the person who thinks he or she is in a hopeless situation. Among the things, though, that can cause a person to do this stupid, silly thing of killing himself or herself is depression. Alcoholism can cause it. Substance abuse, drug abuse, okay? Sometimes anger, letting your temper cause you to do something when you're not thinking right. Anger. Revenge. Sometimes a person thinks revenge. Well, you, you've hurt me. Well, I'll get my revenge. I'll kill myself, and then you're going to feel bad. Stupid. Sometimes illness. A person can get to feeling so bad, hurting so bad, the pain so bad, and they think the only way to get rid of this terrible pain is to end my life. Stupid. Don't do that, folks. There are pain medications that you can take for any kind of pain. Taking pain pills is a lot better than the stupid thing of killing yourself. Physical illness, of course. Here's another thing that I have seen, as I say, working in the funeral business, I've seen this several times. Someone loses a loved one. A guy had a girlfriend, and she dumps him, and he thinks the only thing to do is go out and hang himself. Stupid. Dumb. The loss of a close friend. Sometimes a person who just uh, really finds himself in such a big feeling of sorrow over the death of a close friend, and they go out and kill themselves. What a stupid thing to do, friends. Here's another example that causes people to commit suicide. A loss of a job. Suddenly the job they've been doing for maybe many years, getting a decent salary, and they get fired, and they think, oh man, my life is over. Dumb. A financial setback. A person loses his or her all the money that they had saved up, and they think, how am I going to live now with no money? <laughs> Friends, you can earn more money. You can find a way to get by. People can help you in your financial situations. Killing yourself is not the answer. Another is public humiliation. Someone who has had a good reputation in the community for a long time suddenly does something that's stupid and it lose, causes them to lose their good reputation and they think the only way out of this is to go out and commit suicide. Friend, that's a dumb thing. People who, are, who commit suicide many times, are, that leaves a bad memory of you in the minds of people. Loss of social status. And another reason is schizophrenia. Friends, schizophrenia is, is something that you can get help for. So what I'm saying is, friends, no matter what situation any person might find himself or herself in, suicide is not the answer. It's a stupid thing to do. Now, Suppose now, just suppose you had a loved one who did commit suicide. Maybe, maybe you do. Maybe you do have a loved one who did that. But now maybe you haven't. But I want you to think about this situation. For, for some unknown reason, someone you love commits suicide, okay? Now, okay, think about this. How would you feel if someone walked up and said to you, your husband is in hell now? <laughs> now, I know you're thinking, well, who would say that? Friends, some people who call themselves Christians have said that very thing to other people who have had Loved ones or close friends commit suicide. Some Christians have walked up to those people and said, well, I'm sorry, but uh, he's, he's in hell now or she's in hell now. What a, what a horrible thing to say to somebody. Question number three. 
Why do Roman Catholics and some Protestants believe that suicide automatically disqualifies a person from going to heaven? That's the main question of this sermon. Well, friends, let me answer that question this way. A Christian must believe by faith that Jesus has paid for our sins when he shed his precious blood and died on that cross. That has to be the basic foundation for any Christian's faith. Faith that what Jesus did paid for your sins. Amen? All right. Now, I will admit this. A Christian does need to repent of sin to receive forgiveness, but that's a problem that I'm going to deal with a little closer in a different way here. You do need to repent of your sin to receive salvation, okay? In the beginning, you, you're a person lost in sin. You've never become a Christian before. Now you want to come to Jesus in faith and receive salvation. Yes, you do need to repent of your sin and ask for Jesus to forgive you. That's at the beginning of your Christian life, when you begin to walk with Jesus, okay? That's when you need to repent of your sin. So, the Roman Catholics and a lot of Protestants, unfortunately, say that a person who commits suicide cannot repent of sin, of murder, after he or she is dead. And that's pretty logical to think about. I'd have to admit that, that a person who kills himself or herself is dead, and there's no way they can go to Jesus and ask for forgiveness. That's true. But so then the Roman Catholics and some Protestants would say, well, Brother Dave, if you believe that, then how can that person still go to heaven? All right. First, listen carefully now. First, let's admit that we all commit sin many, many times every day. Don't we? Huh? Admit it. After you got saved, no matter how long ago it was or how short a time ago it was, have you lived a perfect sinless life from that time? You know it's not possible that even after we get saved, we still are going to commit sin. Every Christian from time to time entertains sinful thoughts. And sometimes, in spite of the fact that we are born-again Christians, we behave in sinful ways and sometimes even on a regular basis. So now, if you will agree with me on that, that even after we get saved, we still commit sin, and sometimes we don't behave like a Christian should, the question is, do those sinful thoughts and those sinful actions then disqualify you from going to heaven? Think about that a moment. Okay. 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10 clearly say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So clearly 1 John chapter 1 verses 9 and 10 tell us that we are required to repent as part of our salvation moment when we first get saved, but repentance on a continual basis is not the basis for entry into heaven. And here's where you have to really go back to the original Greek text to get the sense of what God was saying when in, through the Holy Spirit he inspired the Apostle John to write these words that we find in 1 John. It was not written in English. It was written down by John in the Greek language. 
And friends, I've told you this many times before, if you have watched these weekly sermons, the Greek language is a much more descriptive type of language, okay? And when you, if you've ever studied English, you know that there are tenses of the various verbs. Some verbs in the English language are speaking of a one-time thing to do, and some verbs in the English language refer to something that is to be done on a continuing basis, okay? And that's what we find in 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Our repentance is to be a continual basis of repenting of the sins that we've already admitted that we have continued to do from the very day after we got born again. So John was inspired to write these words that I've just read to you here in 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. And these were words, friends, not to the pagans back then, but these were words that John wrote down to be sent to Christians, all right? And he tells them to repent when they sin. Why? To restore righteousness that was imputed to them at the very moment they were saved through Jesus Christ. And when they sin, their close relationship with Jesus gets damaged. Let me illustrate that on a way that's maybe a little easier for you to understand. My dear wife, Pat, and I were married for 41 years. She's, she's gone now. She's with the Lord. We were married back on May 28th in 1976. So as I say, we were together about uh, 41 years uh, before she died. Now, believe it or not, during those years, there were several times when I did something or said something that caused Pat to be angry with me. Do you have that? Do you find that hard to believe that I would do something or say something that would have made Pat mad during all those years together? <laughs> You know it's not stupid. I, I, I'll admit it. I, I did it many times. And quite frankly, she did the same thing. Sometimes she did something or said something that made me mad. So in other words, when I did something that made her angry or hurt her feelings, I sinned against her. Or when she said something or did something that hurt my feelings, she sinned against me. Would you agree with me on that? All right. Now, when I did those things to hurt her feelings or make her angry, were we still married? You know we were. The sin that I committed against her or the sin that she committed against me did not give us a divorce. We were still married. But there's a thing that has to be considered here. Even though we were still married, our close relationship was damaged when we sinned against each other. Sometimes when that happened, believe it or not, I ended up sleeping on this couch behind me that night. Now, what did I have to do to get back into a close relationship with my wife and get myself out of the, off that couch and back into bed with her the next night. What did I have to do? Right, I had to ask her to forgive me, right? Maybe, maybe you understand this because the same thing has happened to you in your marriage. And so what would happen when I asked Pat to forgive me? Well, she was a good loving wife. She would forgive me. She would give me a kiss, and I was no longer sleeping on this couch behind me. Friends, that's a perfect illustration with the born-again Christian's relationship with Jesus Christ. We repent of our sin, not to get our salvation back, but to restore a close relationship with Jesus. But we don't repent to get back salvation, because we didn't lose it in the first place when we sinned. Okay, again, but you would say, a person can't do that after he or she has committed suicide. They can't ask for forgiveness after they're dead, and that's true. But you see, you're missing my point here, friends. 
Suicide does not cause you to lose your salvation. In fact, that's what Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. He said, For I am concerned that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, let's move on to question number four. And this is where the Roman Catholics and some Protestants would come back at me. Question number four, is suicide an unpardonable sin? Is suicide an unpardonable sin? Some people would say it is. Why? Because the person committing suicide cannot ask for forgiveness and therefore will receive eternal punishment in hell. Because the person has died, forgiveness is no longer possible. Well, let's say, friends, that those views are what you believe. I'm going to say to you right now, friends, that understanding grossly is a misunderstanding of biblical truths. Now, I know that probably uh, angers Roman Catholics who are watching this and probably angers a lot of Christians who would say, now listen here, Brother Dave, I've studied the Bible many, many years, and I know what I believe, and I believe the Bible backs this up. But I tell you to you, friends, I still say that if you believe that committing suicide automatically eliminates you from going to heaven and having everlasting life, that is a gross misunderstanding of biblical truth. Let me untangle it for you just a moment here. Yes, as I said in the very beginning, suicide is a sin. It's a stupid, stupid thing to do. But friends, it is not a sin that will automatically result in a person's eternal damnation. Here is the biblical truth. A person's eternal destiny is based on justification. You ever heard that word justification? Unfortunately, not understanding what justification is all about is the reason many Roman Catholics and many Protestants hold on to this idea that suicide sends you to hell. So what is justification? Well, here's a good definition for justification. Justification is an act of God's free grace. Did you hear that? Justification is an act of God's free grace, wherein he pardons all our sins, and he accepts us as righteous in his sight, only by the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is imputed to us, and we are receiving it by faith alone. Did you, did you understand all that? You see, friends, justification is where God pardons all of our sins, not just some of our sins. He pardons our sins of the past, our sins of the present, and all of our future sins, as far as justification is and receiving eternal life, okay? All our sins are pardoned by God through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ to pay for all those sins the moment we are justified through faith alone in Jesus Christ. When a person is justified, the penalty of sin is erased. But the power and the presence of sin are not erased. Every justified person sins after being justified and after being pardoned by God. He or, per, or she 
does not want to sin because they are born again and have the presence of the Holy Spirit. But you know from your personal experience as a born again Christian, you're going to continue to still sin. Sanctification enables that person more and more to overcome sin in his or her life. But he or she will never, never completely eradicate sin until he or she dies and steps into glory. You see, a justified person will continue to commit sin. And that person can perhaps commit suicide. But if that person has been justified through faith alone in Jesus Christ, he or she does not lose his or her salvation. So I say to you, therefore, friends, if you consider what justification is all about, then you would have to agree suicide is not an unpardonable sin. Here's a good illustration. You see, friends, people who believe that suicide disqualifies a person from heaven is living under a very shaky faith and hope for heaven. I, I, I firmly believe that. Because these people are constantly afraid that they are going to do something that will then send them to hell. Even after they've been saved and born again, they constantly live that they're going to do something after they've been saved that instead of going to heaven, now they're going to go to hell because they have sinned in some way. If you look at the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 19, 20, and 21, let me read that to you. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, you ever hated somebody? Contentions, you ever started a disagreement and a fight between people? Jealousies, you ever been jealous of someone? Outbursts of wrath, you ever lost your temper? Selfish ambitions, you ever found yourself being very selfish? Dissensions, heresies, envy, you ever envied what somebody else have? And yeah, there's that word murders. Drunkenness, you ever been drunk? Revelries, you ever have found yourself being a party animal? And then it goes on to say, and the like. Now listen to this. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those, now here's the word, here's the word here, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So all these things that I just read to you here in that passage are things that we look at and we think, well, the Bible says you do these things and all of a sudden you're not going to go to heaven no matter whether you've been born again or not. So again, i got to ask you these questions. Have you ever found yourself doing any of those things? You know you have. I have. Have you ever had sinful thoughts? Have you ever said a cuss word? Have you ever envied what someone said or what someone else had? Have you ever lost your temper? Have you ever been selfish? Well, friends, if what Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21 say, then you've been eliminated from heaven. No, but friends, again, those last few words in verse 21 seem to say that that's true, but listen again to the last sentence. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That word practice is the key to that passage. People who practice or habitually, frequently do any of those sins are people who likely, I would say to you, were never saved in the very first place. Galatians 5, 24 and 25 says, And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Look at it this way. What would happen to any Christian who says a cuss word or has a sinful thought in a moment and before he or she dies in a sudden car crash or a heart attack? 
Think about that. Here's, here's, here's something. To, suppose a guy is driving down the street and suddenly he looks off to his right and here is this sexy looking young lady walking down the street and he has lustful thoughts for that woman. He has a sinful desire for her in his heart. Now, is that a sin? You know it is. He's driving down the street, he's looking at her, and he's not looking where he's going, and suddenly he crashes into a pole and he's killed instantly. Is he going to go to hell? Or, or this, here's another illustration for the ladies. A woman gets into a big argument with another woman. She loses her temper, and after losing her temper, she suddenly suffers a massive heart attack and dies instantly. Now, friends, in those cases, they never had a chance to repent and ask God to forgive them of those sins. So again, the way some people would believe, those, that guy driving down the street who had that sinful thought about that woman, he's in hell now because he didn't get a chance to repent. And the lady who got into a big argument, suffered a heart attack, and died instantly, she didn't have a chance to repent, so those two ladies are in hell. So I, do you believe that? Huh? See, friends, how could any of us feel secure in our salvation if heaven were entirely dependent on the good timing of our deaths? If we believe that a Christian who commits suicide dies without hope of heaven, then we must conclude that most, if not all, Christians have lost the promise of eternal life because they have failed to repent of a specific sin before they died. If continuous confession of sin is a requirement for salvation, then every Christian lives in constant jeopardy, no matter how long you've been a born-again Christian, you're living in constant jeopardy if you believe suicide or any of these other sins and you don't get a chance to repent. You're living in constant jeopardy that you're still going to somehow end up in hell. No, friends, thankfully, God has provided a more powerful salvation. It is by grace alone and not by our works. And though we may sin, and though we may die with unconfessed sin on our account, nevertheless, we still enter into heaven because salvation is based on receiving Christ's righteousness and his justification that is imputed to us, not based on our own perfection. The Bible says that all people, all men, all women, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, God must remove our sin and give us his righteousness if we are to enter into the glories of heaven. And without the righteousness of God, we, had, we would have no hope. By faith, the Heavenly Father assigns Christ's righteousness to us. It is imputed to us. His sinlessness is awarded to us, not earned by us, on the basis of faith alone. It's a gift. So we acquire the perfection that is required to enter heaven based on Christ's perfection and not our own. Christ paid the penalty for our sins on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Philippians 3, 9, and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So our entrance, entrance into heaven is made possible solely on the basis of our faith in Christ's death and resurrection, which brings us Christ's righteousness. The Bible calls on all people to repent and believe. 
in order to receive this free gift of salvation and eternal life. But that repentance the Bible speaks about there is a one-time turning from dead works and turning toward Christ in faith, as Hebrews chapter 6, 1 says, therefore leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Running out of time, so I better put a bow on this. Every Christian has literally thousands of unconfessed sins to his or her account. Every one of us does. We probably have forgotten far more sins than we could ever be remembered and much less get the chance to confess. Simply put, friends, we can't sin our way out of God's grace and mercy once we have been clothed in his righteousness. Therefore, repenting and confessing every sin in our daily lives is not a prerequisite for entering into heaven. Yes, it's a prerequisite for having a close relationship to God and to Jesus Christ our Savior, but it's not for eternal life. Every true Christian who commits suicide can still enter heaven because that person was saved at the point of their confession in Jesus Christ, and no sin can ever separate a Christian from the love of God, not even the sin of self-murder. Romans chapter 8, verse 38, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let me close quickly by saying this. This message is not in any way, in any way, an encouragement for any person to commit suicide. Don't do it, friends. It's a stupid thing to do. It's a selfish thing to do. And no matter how bad you may be feeling at any particular time, I often tell other people there's a certain uh, sentence that we find many times in the uh, New Testament, and it's these words, and it came to pass, and it came to pass. In other words, no matter what was going on at any particular time, those situations came to pass and things went on. I'm telling you, friends, the same thing can happen to you. No matter what bad situation you might find yourself in, it can get better, and it will, if you don't do the stupid thing the selfish thing of killing yourself. Don't do it, friends. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I know this has been a very controversial message, and I know there's going to be some people who still disagree with me, but I hope, Lord, that this message will help people who have really been struggling, groping with sorrow because they have a loved one who did commit suicide, and they have struggled with it. I hope, Lord, this message will help them. Uh, it will comfort them. That's the purpose of this message, Lord. And, oh, Lord, I, I let you now to send it out wherever you might to the people who need to get this message today. This I pray in Jesus' name, and amen. Well, thank you for watching Gospel Preaching today. Lord willing, if he gives me another week of life, I'll be back next week with another message from God's Word. In the meantime, my prayer is that God will richly Bless you.